This is Eric Roskamabing, and this is the Service Design Show. In the Service Design Show, we talk to people who are shaping the service design industry. In this episode, we have a very special guest, also from the Netherlands, um, Erik Roskam Abing. You might know Erik because he's the author of uh, this book, Brand Driven Innovation, already a classic, I think, in the, uh, in the industry. Erik is also, of course, the founder of Silver Innovation, and he's a teacher at the Technical University in Delft uh, related to service design, customer experience design, and, of course, Brand Driven Innovation. Welcome to the show, Erik. Thank you, Mark. Good to see you. Uh, and, did I forget um, something in that introduction? No, you didn't. I mean, yeah. I mean, those are my my work my work credentials, and then I also have a private life with a great family and kids and all that. But we'll skip that topic for now. Well, okay. Eric, do you recall your first memory of service design? Yes, I I do very clearly. Um, it was an article published by the BNO in their um, in their monthly magazine about about service design, where I think Silver and Thirty One Volts and Design Thinkers and Eden Speakerman were mentioned as the Dutch protagonists of of service design. Mm -hmm. And to be very honest, that was the first time that I read my name associated with the word service design, and then I. You know, and my reaction was, ah, is, is that what we do? Um, and talking to many people in the industry, um, I, I know that many of, of us have had that sort of realization where, ah, service design, ah, that's what I do. So I think <laughs> the, the name is sort of represents what we've been doing all along, but it sort of it, it clicked. And I think this was, what, six years ago, seven years okay. ago or something? I'm not sure. Okay, yep. so this was an, uh, a magazine uh, from the Dutch Association of Designers, right? Exactly. That, that, yep. that, that exactly. They put yep. a label on you uh, that you are a service designer or, and yes, that you're doing exactly. service design. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and I've been a bit um, recalcitrant in a way. I, 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 I thought, no, I'm, you know, I, I was raised in Delft with, with user-centeredness and with taking the business aspect into consideration and human technology and all that was part of my upbringing. So I had a bit of trouble framing it as a different design discipline mm -hmm. because for me it was very much, you know, this is what design should be about anyway. Yeah. So yeah. Why, should we, yeah. why should we put a label on it? Um, but um, service design has become so big and the community is so great and even our clients are embracing it as a good, as a good framing. Um, I've stopped fighting it, and now I'm um, I'm wholeheartedly part of the community and proudly so. So um. <laughs> good, um, Eric. Let's explain uh, the format of what we're going to do for the viewers who are actually watching this uh, for the first time. It's it's really easy because uh, I have uh, three topics here uh, written on uh, a nice piece of paper, and you also have a few papers yourself with yeah. some question starters, right? That's right. I have right. here. For example, why and how much. And All right. So I'll, um, what we'll do, I'll be holding up a paper with a topic and um, you'll associate a question starter with that. And it's up to you to start your rant about the topic based on that okay. question. Yeah. Easy, right? Easy. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so let's, uh, let's move on. And I show the first one. So I won't start with that one. I'll, I'll start with this topic and it's called... On the inside. On the inside. Nice. Yes. I think what I would like to do with on the inside is the why. So the question would be, why are more and more organizations um, internalizing their experience design and surface design capabilities? Um, I think only two or three years ago, this was something you clearly outsourced to agencies. Mm -hmm. uh, and now more and more we see that our customers have uh, internal uh, customer experience departments, they hire service designers, they, they have service design as a discipline on board internally. Why is that? And I think um, 
let me first of all say that I'm very optimistic about this uh, mm -hmm. this development. I think it's a great sign of maturity. I think it's a great sign of um, the value of, of of what surface design could be. I also think um, it's a sign of the importance. You know, when you internalize something. Um, it means it's it's vital to your business, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the things that, that are not vital, you can outsource. The things that are vital, you keep inside. Um, but the why question is interesting because uh, I think we could talk about um, what makes these companies realize that this is something that they want to learn and that is so key to their business that it becomes you know part of the full-time capabilities they have on board. Um, and I think this has to do with with a few things: the the, the urgency of, of being really customer centric, and not only as lip service, but as a you know as, as something you actually you know put to practice every day. And has this urgency the has increased in the recent years. I think the um, the urgency to actually start doing something about it has increased in the sense that I think it, it, it has been fashionable to say that you're customer centric for a long time. I think more and more companies are realizing that this takes a lot of effort and a lot of work and that you actually you know, have to put your money where your mouth is and start doing things, um, which has consequences for HR, for IT, for everything, for how you organize your business, how you structure it, um, for all the channels you operate in. Um, and it's simply too big to um, to to frame this in you know sporadic uh, projects that you do on and off. No, this is this is part of your ongoing business. This is what you are, or what you this should be. What, exactly, exactly. And um, so, so I think organizations are starting to realize that, and they're starting to realize that uh, customer centricity and you know, service design or design thinking are um, uh, are all part of the capabilities that you need to have on board in order to to put this to practice every day of the week. Next to all your, you know, all the other efforts you're doing and all your 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 business capabilities and marketing and sales and purchasing and, and you name it. Um, so then you see um, customer experience departments emerge where this capability is uh, is founded and where uh, people are responsible for the customer experience within the company. It's a good sign. Um, I see these departments struggling because they have very little political power and maybe their budget isn't big enough and they end up hiring external help anyway. So, But, but together, um, they are a step in the right direction, I think. Um, other companies, I see one of our clients, a large uh, car rental um, uh, company, has actually put a customer experience lead in the board of directors. All right. So that means that on the very highest level, they have someone uh, responsible for the customer journey. Um, I think that's even a stronger sign uh, because he works with IT, he works with operations, he works with with sales, with, with all the channel managers, with all the country managers. And I think that's a better way of really infusing this way of thinking in the organization. Um, but then again, he, he needs more people around him, so mm -hmm. he's starting his own department as well. And I think it, we'll end up with some kind of hybrid uh, form that works. Um, but in whatever way you organize it, I think it's really a sign of maturity uh, that companies need this, want this. Uh, another thing I see happening is the digitalization of, of, of many channels has put uh, user experience at the forefront mm -hmm. and a lot of UX people are yeah. embracing service design just as a more holistic way of looking yeah. at. Yeah, at, at, so it's a logical customers. transition or a logical exactly. evolution. Exactly. exactly, yeah. So for many banks uh, or many insurance companies or many of our clients, the the transition towards internalizing service design starts with the internalization of UX, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. is which is a logical step simply because yeah. there's so much work to do. It's too expensive to you know to outsource this to agencies, um, and and then and then it starts from there, and then you can question the level of service design. If you approach this from UX, you know I think it's always a bit too digital. I think the mm -hmm. customer journeys are always a bit too much about the customer using our touch points rather than yeah. the life yeah. of the customer. Yeah, but that's a different topic. Hmm. So, if you would have to summarize why 
organizations are internalizing service design would be one that the need is becoming higher, greater maturity yeah. of the yeah. uh, field. And two is maybe that it's it's uh, growing growing from the inside, coming from UX. Yeah, I, I guess those two are are, are the main uh, are the main reasons. You could also say that on the so the demand side is growing, but the supply side is always also growing, right? We right. have more people leaving great educational programs and enter the market as service designers. So you see that it becomes a profession, um, and that might be a third um, a hmm. third mechanism that is going on. Yeah, uh, has your um conversation with clients changed over the last two, three years in that sense? It has. And um, we embrace this development because it has brought us a lot of work. Because what mm. we get is our clients say, listen, we want to internalize these capabilities. You know, bring do this project with us and teach us how to do it. And so next mm. to our consulting practice, we have quite a nice training practice that are, that we are developing where we're actually teaching our clients how to do it themselves partly i think partly you will always be you know you always need specialized agencies right. or consultancies right. but the um, the training uh, value proposition has has grown in our business uh, yeah. because our clients ask to learn which is great i, yeah. I think uh, our over the interviews that i've had so far this seems to be a really key topic uh, at yeah. at this moment yeah. And yeah. it's really interesting to see how it will be developed because you already said some are setting up service design departments. I've mm -hmm. talked with Anna van Oostrom who said service design shouldn't be a department. So it's yeah. really, really interesting to see how this yeah. will uh, play out. Exactly. Well, if you see how um, what happened to marketing in the 60s, 70s, 80s of the last century, that also matured from something you you bought at an advertising agency to something mm. that was part of the part of the board, you know. Now and now you have CMOs everywhere. Um, so I guess it was external, and then it became a department, and then it became a capability, and then it became a function, etc. Mm. Um, and and it, I wouldn't be surprised if we sort of enter that same evolution. And I fully agree with Arne that it shouldn't be a department. On the other hand. A department is better than nothing, um, and I think it's a logical step in an evolution. Exactly right. Yeah. Eric, let's move on to uh, to a second topic. Um, yes. I've written down here experience pro prototyping. Yes, I think I will have the what if question there. What um, if? What if we would if we would prototype experiences like we prototype products, or like we, you know, in the lean startup world, we prototype apps or MVPs or whatever? I think um, prototyping is one of the most interesting and and most powerful aspects of design um, because it really allows you to to take a step in the future without being hurt too much and, mm -hmm. and really really pr projecting yourself into the future, looking around, learning from it, going back to the now and applying that learning on whatever it is you're developing. Um, and I think there's a huge potential for prototyping services, prototyping customer experiences, etc. cetera. Um, and I think there's a lot to, to be learned there and a lot to be developed in terms of tooling and methodologies. Um, a lot to be explored in terms of what is the effect of it. And uh, because we were so curious about it, we said, what if we just apply this in our projects? And we just try to sell it to our clients and say, listen, we're designing all these wonderful customer journeys for you and personas and whatever, but let's, let's just go out and do it. Yeah. So for this same car rental company, we've chosen 10 initiatives in different countries um, that help them improve their customer experience. And for each initiative, we went to the rental station, worked with the local staff, co-created solutions, um, built them in a day, and tested them with their, uh, with, and had them actually test it with their clients. Um, and it was a wonderful experience. It, it it brought so much in terms of real user feedback, mm -hmm. commitment from the staff, um, solid business cases as to you know what will this actually do for the business. Um, commitment from higher up, people said, ah, is that what you mean with customer experience? 
I want this. Mm -hmm. You know, so it was yeah. the, the the famous oil stain. People embracing it. It was really but good. Can you can you say something about how did you actually prototype the service? Because I think a lot of people that I speak to find it really hard to imagine in their head how you prototype yeah. something that is not yeah. tangible. Yeah, that is, and that is of course the challenge, and 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 I think that's part of the. Part of why I why I like this topic so much there there is there are no golden rules for it. It really depends on 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 what you're doing. One of the things we did is we chose experiences that have a relatively low digital uh, aspect to them. So we chose, let's say, analog services. For example, uh, you come to rent a car. And as a as a as a desk employee, I try to explain you what ex what insurance options you have. This moment is always experienced as pushy and as very commercial. And just give me my car. And we all know that, right? Yeah, you, you know the feeling. Whereas actually, um, it's it's of course from a from a business case perspective, it's a huge source of income from the car rental, but also from a customer experience perspective. Um, we knew that people who leave the who leave the station well insured feel better, um, so there is some value to be gained there. So we looked at this experience and we and we redesigned it very much from a communication perspective. So how can you, rather than selling someone this insurance, explain it better to them? So basically, what we did is we designed some tools, just visible, tangible tools that help these these desk employees explain the value of the insurance better. Mm -hmm. And this was imagine some kind of card where you can leave through or you can turn a wheel to to explain some things. It's just tangible mm -hmm. stuff, mm -hmm. um, and. So in this case, we, we, we went from some user insights, some business insights to a personal interaction that you can fa facilitate through physical tools. Mm -hmm. and, there, and there's a lot to be gained and you don't have to invest in any app or IT system or CRM system or all these things. Um, so one way of framing experience prototyping is keep it very small, keep it at first keep it tangible keep it in the form of how can we interact better and role play it and see what happens and we we just we just built the thing we tested it for a day we had i think 50 client interviews and all of them you know hmm. we did something with mps and mps was raised by a number of digits and it, it was just simple stuff but it was yeah. very clear that this was helping people um so so my first tip would be keep it small keep it analog and also um, be creative because things can be prototyped that at first, exactly like you're saying, are very seem very hard to prototype. Uh, but I've I've prototyped business models with Volkswagen in mm -hmm. the form of role plays, you mm -hmm. know, and mm -hmm. and it's just this tremendous um, abstraction is all of a sudden turned into something that you can embrace or improve or work with just by making it tangible. Well, mm. I, I think the, also the hard part with prototyping services is that a lot of people focus on how it should look instead mm -hmm. of how it should feel. Exactly. And I think yeah. once you focus, once you get yeah. that into into your mind, it's yeah. it's not that hard to actually prototype it. And and that's 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 really good that you say that because this has to do also with the imagination of users, right? If you if you give users something that they can give their opinion on and you say listen it's not finished yet and it looks like crap we know that but hey if if you would be able to use something like this would you like it and and just take them along in your storytelling and and take them along in the prototyping and make them feel comfortable with something that's unfinished you get great responses uh, so it's also about the the courage to be to be unfinished and to to be to be messy and to show it to your to your user. Yeah, yeah and that's also I think a very uh, big topic because there isn't a lot of space and room within large organizations to actually be messy. True, and 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 again, that's where it really helps if you're an outside consultant where you say, "Hey, we are from from the outside. We made it messy. It's not it's not the the, the brand itself, you know." Um, it's sort of um, a nice, a nice way of making mistakes legitimately because it's always, you know, it's the consultancy who does it, not them. You can blame um, us, yeah. 
Yeah, exactly. But and this is a, in in prototyping. This is a huge topic. Uh, are you allowed to make mistakes? What kind of mistakes are you making? Are you designing the mistakes? You know, are you making them small? Um, are you preparing the customer for it? And are you taking them along? Um, this is all very key and and very vital. And I think not a whole lot of people are very good at this. So and. And, and from the service design community, you know, from the supply side, I think also we have a lot to learn there to help our clients embrace this kind of early uh, trial and error. And, um, but, in a, but also in a focused way, if you look at what, what the Lean Startup does with this continuous learning and sort of um, shut off all assumptions and just learn – that's also not fully the thing. I, I don't mm. fully believe in that. I think there's huge power in intuition and in very focused prototyping where um, you have, um, you have your, your, your design approach where you have this very uh, strong intuition based on user insights and based on business savviness of where an opportunity might lie and then you prototype from there. So it's different than the, than the classical MVP approach, I think. Yeah. Interesting. I think uh, this should be a topic that uh, we basically, I think, also need a lot more case studies showing yeah. how it yeah. works, uh, what yeah. it delivers, what the value yeah. is. Yeah. Um, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And and what we've been doing is we've been offering it very cheaply to our clients simply because we want to learn. So that that yeah. is one way yeah. of of. Yeah. Um, um, of, 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 of growing your own experience and making sure that you develop a body of knowledge and a, yeah. and a repository of case studies. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. <clears throat> Eric, let's, uh, let's move on to uh, the third and uh, last topic that I have here in front of me. And it's, um, it's called DIY. Do It Yourself. I, it yeah. sort of relates to the first, I guess. It does relate to the first topic. Do you have uh, a question starter that goes with that one? Yeah. So um, um, yeah. So when will? Um, and I think yeah, it, it it relates to the first topic, but I I like to frame it a little a bit more from an um, from an individual level. When will um, HR departments start to uh, require a certain element of design thinking or designerly approaches or? You know, people centeredness and creativity in any function, whether it be a sales function or an or a, a purchasing function or a marketing mm -hmm. function. Um, because I mean, if you see now the the huge um, sort of increase in interest in these kind of approaches, um, you could imagine that five years from now everyone in any function is doing this themselves. Uh, I have an accountant who is embracing a lot of our approaches in his work. Simply, and, and I didn't tell him to, simply that's his intuition. He thinks accountancy should be more human-centered, it should be more creative, it should be more customized, it should be more iterative, etc. Um, so he's, he's DIYing, you could say, design thinking in his own practice. Um, and I think that's a that's a very interesting development and um, and also I mean we cannot claim this right this is not invented by designers this is not ours to to protect or keep this is simply um, if you're if you're optimistic like I am this is where the, the world is moving towards um, um, and and I think this will do a lot with our educational systems this will do a lot with how we run businesses with how we co-create, how we uh, run municipalities and cities, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. how we look at, um, you know, uh, co-creating solutions for environmental issues, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, mm -hmm. and this is very much about embracing this kind of thinking on a very individual level and start doing it yourself. Mm -hmm. yeah. So uh, um, what you're basically saying is everyone should at least have a design attitude and mindset somewhere within them and probably already has exactly yes exactly and and that's that's another thing that i find really inspiring is that um when i work with people i try to trigger this in them and i try mm -hmm. to sort of wake up the silent designer in them um and it works you know people when you when you put people at ease and when you make people understand sort of 
you know, in the context in which we are innovating and you make it safe and understandable and inspiring, uh, you see many people embracing this uncertainty and embracing this human centeredness and embracing this, this what if quality of what if we would do things differently. So that's, that's really interesting. Another, another thing that I, when I, when I, when I thought of this DIY topic is also, um, um, we've been putting a lot of stress on putting the customer at the heart of everything we do. But we I'm as, a very, we as a service design community, as, as service design community, but, but let's face it. I mean, this is not ours. We didn't invent this. It's all mar marketing and, um, the whole digital community is very much about user centeredness, yeah. et cetera. Um, what I always find interesting is there's this very nice quote by Ayn Rand, who you can think of what you want, but she had at least one really nice quote where she says, you can, f you can only say I love you if you can say I. Meaning there has to be a, an individual, there has to be some, someone you know, feeling that love. And what I sometimes miss in a lot of companies is that they say they want to be human-centered and they want to put the user at the heart of everything you do. But, but what about them? What about you? What do you stand for? What are your core values? And what are your beliefs? And what are your dreams? And then it's quite empty there. Uh, so I try to teach them, you know, DIY, first look at yourself, first, first discover in yourself what it is you really need, what it is you're dreaming of, what, how can you relate your business objective to your you know personal aspirations and your brand values and your future vision because then it's a lot easier to go outside and meet people and connect with them and you know build meaningful relationships through the products and services you offer them so start on the inside then go outside and a lot of our work is um, has been on the inside of companies you know teaching companies to first look at themselves yeah, yeah, I, I see this really happening in our projects too, is that we tend to focus more and more sometimes even on internal services, you know, you yeah. can't provide, yeah. you can't be exactly. customer centric if you are not that for your employees and, exactly. you know, exactly. what, what is the yeah. reason why people get up out of bed and, uh, and go to work, right? Exactly, yeah, and then it's not about user centeredness, but it's about, it's about people centeredness and exactly. companies are people and mm. should be people at least. So, and not so, so is this the is this the next frontier within uh, our community that we'll first have to fix internal organizations before we can actually start looking at customers? Well, I do think that um, the, the I don't I don't know if it's the next frontier because I think we're facing a few frontiers, but um, I think it's one very important element in what we need to learn and what we need to become good at. We need to really understand how organizations work. Um, and I mean, if you're working for a startup or a small, you know, a, a business owned by the founder, then, then the complexity is much less. And then you can do great work with them because usually the guy at the helm or the woman at the helm is the one with the dreams and the vision. And then it's rather easy. But these big organizations, I mean, they, they're very hard to, um, to work with, and I do think that that is where a lot of the magic really happens. If you can, mm. if you can work on the inside, and like you say, you know, design internal services or make people feel important, and have every vote count, and uh, have people genuinely co-create together in throughout the silos um, with a sh on the basis of a shared vision and a shared understanding of what they're good at and what they the goals they want to reach that is hugely powerful and i think also there's there's now a lot of um like interest from the business consulting community in what we do and i think the the overlap is very interesting i think yeah. there's synergy possible yeah all right um let's leave it at that for for this topic um eric uh, you're a teacher so you will probably get this question a lot but um, what would be your most valuable tip for aspiring service designers, people who want to get into service design? What would be your yeah. most valuable tip? I think, I think right now, I mean, I get, I think maybe 
10 or 20 emails per week of people, you know, wanting to work in service design and wanting to, um, to, be, to, be, to be part of what we do, um, which makes me very happy and very proud. But what I usually see in these, in the, in the emails I get is a, a certain type of, of naive uh, belief in creativity and user-centeredness. And I think, I mean, I don't want to put it down because it's really important and it's really nice, but it is commoditizing. I, I can get good user researchers um, quite easily. What's a lot more um, valuable for me, for us, um, is people who can combine that with, with a business understanding and with uh, a real keen sense of how to translate that into business language and how to, how to sell that to the client. And this, this sensitivity of how companies work and how user-centeredness and creativity can be put to work inside an organization, this is what I'm really looking for. So I would advise any service designer who's now doing some form of education to, to focus on that element more and to, to learn there and to you know, invest in business literature, <laughs> doing internships mm -hmm. at companies, getting inside these organizations. Mm -hmm. and, uh, because I think there is some, some lacking... Um, talent, yeah. All right. Um, and, th and then, and the challenge is always um, to keep combining it with your design skills, right? To 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 put on the right hat at the right moment, and to switch perspectives, and to switch roles, and um, but but that you know that requires a lot of experience. I think it starts with just you know being open to gaining the right knowledge, reading the right books, going to the right conferences, doing the right kind of internships, those kind of things. Maybe yeah. uh, designers uh, focus too much on design at this moment. I, I fully agree with you. Yeah, I think we're, I mean, and, and we've said it a lot, and we're a little bit too much in love with our own process. Mm -hmm. and our own, But let's face it, we have, you know, it is great. It's easy mm -hmm. to fall in love with, right? Mm -hmm. but, it's, but it's only part of the, um, it's only part of the magic mix. Uh, and I think what, um, Ultimately, what companies are buying from us is not this creative stuff you see here in the mm. background. What, the, mm. what they're buying from us is outcomes, you know, right. business outcomes that make them money in a good, sustainable way, um, which, we can, which we can offer them if we combine this with, with their, you know, within their ecosystem. Mm -hmm. yeah. Eric, um, this is your opportunity. Uh, <clears throat> Do you have a question for people that are actually watching this episode right now? What would be your question for them? Oh, that's a good one. Uh, nice. Um, yeah, I, th I think if, if, we, if we take this last topic and turn it into a question, why would a big company, a big bank, a big oil company, a big insurance company... Um, why would they hire you? What, what is the value that they see in you? What kind of qualities do they see that make them want to work with you? And I think if you cannot answer that question very clearly, you still have some learning to do. So um, I think, I think that's, uh, that's the mirror I would like to put in front of the, the community. That is, you know, the surface designers watching this movie, I hope, a lot of non-service designers watch this movie and from them I would like to hear um, um, from your perspective what do you what do you see changing in your business what are the transitions that you're that you're facing where old let's say you know methodologies and tooling don't work any longer and where you're looking for for new ways of solving problems so what made you watch this video maybe what made you watch this video that's a that's a great question actually <laughs> <laughs> Good really interesting. <clears throat> really curious how people will react. So, um, Eric, we need to uh, we need to leave it uh, at this. So, very much, very much. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your uh, uh, giving us the opportunity to tap into your mind and uh, know what is going on and uh, reading a bit uh, uh, about the future of, of our, our profession. So, uh, Eric, thanks again. You're very welcome. I really enjoyed it. It was great to talk. Thanks for giving me this opportunity. What are your thoughts about the topics we've just discussed with Eric in this episode? 
Also, if you have any suggestions on who we should invite next to the show, be sure to let us know down below in the comments. If you enjoyed this episode and like to see more interviews with surf design pioneers, be sure to subscribe and check out some of our past episodes. With the Service Design Show, we help you to stay one step ahead by talking to the people that are actually shaping the service design field. Thanks for watching.